I'm joined now by Paul Etheridge, uh, past president and most importantly member number one uh, of the Institute. Uh, and I'm going to talk to Paul uh, today about three things in principle. Firstly, uh, financial planning and, and how he came to be a financial planner. Uh, the profession of financial planning, uh, how he has been part of that development, how he sees the future and then how we're going to do and take financial planning to the consumer in the future. So thank you Paul um, and if I can I'd like to start right back at the beginning for you uh, and, and what brought you to, to financial planning? Originally Nick, a chap called John Percival at Safe and Prosper. Did you ever know John? I did. He, I with him. Did you? Yes. Well, John was trying to promote um, involvement with the International Association for Financial Planning in America. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was still managing director of one of Tyree Law's companies then, but uh, I went over to look at one or two of the things there. They quite clearly had a structure there that we hadn't got over here. And initially, I tried to encourage people to join the IAFP in the States. Yes. But when I tried to encourage people in Britain to join, there was an apparent reluctance to join something which they thought was almost entirely American. Right. So it seemed logical to try and form a new body over here. So Prestwood had already been going a couple of years before um, we got as far as trying to start the Institute. And because we were exhibiting at various conferences and we were in touch with a lot of advisors, um, I wrote to, I think it was about 30 odd people, inviting them to come to a meeting in Wembley mm -hmm. where we could discuss the possibility of forming something new. And I think, I, my memory is not reliable now, but I think about 200 people turned up, yes. which was interesting for a start. And in a very short space of time, clearly they said, yeah, let's do something. Right. Um, what was quite amusing looking backwards was that the initial capital of the Institute was my wife and my secretary each holding a waste paper basket at the exit road, yes. exit door, asking for people to throw in paper money as they left. Right. Um, and that's what we started with. Um, Prestwood, directly or indirectly, did fund most of the early days of the Institute, which we were very happy to do. Yes. Uh, but it didn't grow as fast as we had hoped. No. I remember at the first council meeting, we said, well, you know, let's rush it too much. If we get a thousand members in the first year and then perhaps build on that, mm -hmm. well it took us a little bit longer than that first year to get the thousand members. Yes. But it, clearly, almost from the beginning, there was real interest. I trailed around the country giving odd talks about the IFP and everywhere there were a small number, small number, it wasn't vast numbers, of people who were interested and wanted to join and there clearly was a way forward. So for when everybody was joining, at, the, at that stage, were people joining because they had seen the light with financial planning or was it more collegiate? It was the people that were there that, that, that they liked and wanted to, to be, be part of that journey? I think there was a mixture of reasons, Nick. There, there was a, um, a sense of identity, one with another. They weren't queuing up in their thousands. Um, there was also the start of the move towards fee charging. Right. And that was, you know, we were all a bit odd at that time if mm. we were charging fees, but it yeah. was catching on. Yes. And so they, people wanted to exchange ideas about that and then Gradually, they, they became also more aware of the technology and that they could restructure their businesses in a, in a way that was much more predictable in terms of future earnings and satisfaction. So I think it just, a lot of things came together. Came together. And if you reflect back, as member number one, you reflect back on the last 25 years now of, of, of the IFP, what do you think the key stages in the development of the profession have been as, as you've been very much part of them and driven them? What have been the sort of stage posts that you've seen or would identify? I think an awareness of the whole principle of what we're trying to do, particularly linked to people's lifestyle, yes. because there's no other profession that is committed to helping people to achieve the lifestyle they want um, and to maintain it having achieved it. Yes. So that's a major driving point. There's also the issue that more and more people are having to make provision for their own retirement income, mm -hmm. you know, the demise of many forms of pension arrangement, the fact that people now are beginning, even now only beginning, to realise with a pretty awful shock mm. that they are going to have one heck of a job to have an adequate retirement income. Yes. So that arose. Um, there was the fact that people were prepared now to say, we will always have our meetings in our own offices because we can set it up better. It is more advantageous to our clients to do it in that way. And we want to, you to meet the rest of the team because people were also starting to delegate uh, support. I mean, I've said for so many years, yes. 
the role of a, those who have got the knowledge, skills and experience to be financial planners should spend nearly all their time advising clients and earning money. Yeah. Advising clients and earning money, advising clients and earning money. And, you know, I mentioned it a few dozen times, but it it's, it's correct. That's, the, that's one of the breakthrough points to starting to build a much more reliable and predictably profitable business. Yes. And all of that was happening. Yes. And, and if you look at the, 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 the professional developments, and you, you mentioned earlier on, particularly the, the trips to America, and I know you and others similarly, but there weren't a lot of people learned a lot from what was happening there. Uh, in 1995, uh, the IFP launched a certified financial planner in the UK. How significant has that been, do you think, in terms of shaping people's focus into those skills of delivery? I think because more people were going to international conferences, mainly in the United States and Australia, yeah. um, we had become something of a laughing stock in the UK. And people say, where on earth are you going to get your act together? You know, why aren't you? The international qualification or, or, you know, uh, is the certified financial planner. Yes. How come after all this time you've got 14 CFPs or something silly? Yes. And so you went through the same experience I did. You go to Australia, well, you know, we're sort of getting there, but we hadn't got there. No. And so I think that um, was becoming a bit of a driving force. Uh, it would have been nice originally if the charter had been on the table, but it wasn't for other reasons. Yes. Uh, and so CFP, which is the much more widely recognised qualification internationally, became more important. Yes. So how, how, lo how far do you think along the road of the development profession are we? What still needs to be done, Paul, do you think? A lot has been achieved, mm. but the areas I think that still need huge attention are the skills involved in financial planning. The education, the academic qualifications are being there for all sorts of reasons, not least because the FSA is requiring it. Yeah. But there is still a huge gap in people acquiring the, the interpersonal school, uh, skills yes. to help people to understand what the whole thing is about yeah. and to move forward. It's not just a party piece. People have got to learn about digging deeper questions and finding out whatever comes up. I, I have a thing of saying, so what? Whatever piece of information emerges with a client, so what? What are the implications of that? Yes. And you're playing sort of three-dimensional chess to say, well, if that's that, then what about this over here and up there? And I think that's been a very important part of it. Those skills have not been very well acquired yet. Okay. And people are still, in general, reluctant to do planning with clients. They're still doing it for clients and then presenting a report. Okay. Well, we never back. present reports. No, I know. I'm going to come back and I'm going to focus back in on your business and, and how you develop yeah. the proposition. Uh, and I'll ask you a question back to you. So what would the IFP have to do now if you're still involved to, to, to further those, those sorts of attributes? So what would we do next? I think that... Um, we learned a lot when we did the fast track course for the CFP. Yeah. And I think an element of that was people could cross out a week in the diary, come along, learn things they needed to learn, and that was it, done, yep. in many cases. Yes. I think something similar to that would be good with the skills. Right. More role playing, more understanding, having someone putting a little bit of pressure on them to say, yes, but what? what's the implication of that? Yeah. So the skills, I think, are still a long way to go. Okay, and I know and I'll link, start linking back in perhaps to your, to your business and the roles you still perform and, and in that skills area, you, you at Press would do provide a, a mentoring service, yes, advanced financial planner. So how, how, what have you learned from, from that um, or, or how, can we, how can we make more of that, sh shall we say, in terms of... I think that um, many of the people who have got the knowledge, skills and experience are very willing to share that knowledge and the skills and experience. Yeah. And I found when we were asking people, would you like to participate in the regional coaching, every single one immediately said yes. Yeah. They didn't say, are you going to pay us something? They said, yes, of course we would. We're committed to trying to further financial planning, proper financial planning. Yeah. So I think that, that there's room for that to spread a lot further. Right. Um, but there is you know, a cost of time and various other ways. People will only go so far at any one time, then they need to sort of stand back and absorb and practice something they've learned. Yes. Uh, I, I make a comparison sometimes that in, it, with co computer-aided design, there's a, an internationally standard set of software that you can take from just being a DIY home operator to a three-year degree course. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to get to a three-year degree course in proper financial planning skills. No. Not yet, anyway. Okay. But I think there's a, there's a lot more in to be In terms of the dream. Now, I'm going to take you into, back into your business. Now, you, you said earlier on when we were, when you were launching the IFP, Press would have been in, in existence for some while. Mm. 
Uh, at what stage in, in your own career did you start to deliver financial planning as you still advocate it now? Or, or have you always done that? Well, I know you formed, but tell, us, tell me a little bit to so you get some understanding of... It, uh, it, it was really planner. a big step forward when I started Prestwood, because that was 37 years ago. Yes. And before that, I was running one of Tyree Law's companies, as I think you know, yeah. um, and we were doing a very primitive form of financial planning at that time, but it was more akin to salesman, salesmanship rather yes. than proper planning. Yes. Uh, because there was no fee element. Yes. And so people only got paid if they received commission. Yes. And so that was a, a tremendous step forward. When I started Prestwood, from day one, I wanted it to be fee-based mm -hmm. because it seemed to be the, the only way of delivering properly what clients needed and wanted, what they needed. Yes. They hadn't quite got to the stage of wanting <laughs> it, but they needed it. No. So that was a big step forward. That was a big step. And, 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 and where, where did you get your support to that? Was that all from the, the Etheridge brain? Was that as part of your... Um, trips to, to, to America? How, it how was did, nothing to do with should... America at all. It was just logical. I mean, yeah. it's a, a, of course we should have recurring income. Yeah. And, and then the, the, the cash flow modelling and, and that part of it, which is very much part of the hallmark of many financial planners now. That was a bit later. Yeah. Um, but we really sort of pioneered the lifelong cash flow and the financial planning side there only about 20 years ago. Right. It wasn't back in the, the very beginning. Yeah. And... If I can just talk about on the cash flow modelling, because I think to your frustration in other parts of the world to see how people are applying financial planning, yeah. we're certainly still seeing a lot more IFP members, financial planning firms who are now uh, using it. Yeah. How, how fundamental, it's obviously fundamental to your business, how fundamental is it, do you think, to financial planning? It is absolutely fundamental. I don't know how. The, this, this morning I was talking on the same subject, yeah. and uh, there are a whole load of questions that people need to get answered. And there's two ways of doing it. One, which is the traditional method, is guessing. Yes. Well, that, that's true. Yes. How, how else do people do? Mm -hmm. All the different, you know, the sort of questions that people ask. Guesswork was what was being standard in the past. The only other way is to do it properly, and you've got to have a lifelong cash flow to do that. Mm -hmm. I can't now imagine doing proper planning without a lifelong cash flow. And, and, and so what do, you, what do you say, apart from, uh, as you sort of presented, to those advisors who struggle with where they slot it in or where they, where they fit it into their process as part of this whole, I suppose, mentoring and the, and the groups that have come to yes, you. Yes, that, that's important. I think the best thing is if they can actually come along and, and see how we do it. Yeah. Because I don't, I never say to anybody as a prospective client, would you like to have a comprehensive financial plan? Mm. They wouldn't have the faintest idea what they're talking about. So um, what, I, what I'm saying to people is, uh, may I just explain what we do here? Yeah. And then I, I, I don't just describe it, I show them what we do here mm -hmm. and I will use the lifelong cash flows at the very first meeting. Not everyone would agree with that. People have different ways of doing it. Yeah. But I absolutely, totally am committed to doing it at the first meeting. Yes. Because how else can A, you show people what you do, and B, identify whether they are going to, if you're going to be able to help them, are you going to be able to add value? Yes. You've got to see where it's heading. And, and, and where does experience tell you that obviously clients initially coming to you, or certainly from feedback from other planners, mm -hmm. People are perhaps, I might say, reticent to do it, but they don't, they're not as engaged in the process and the rounding numbers or they can't give that information. How, how have you dealt with clients who have been slow to understand the... Uh, the, the I've never the met any. <laughs> but no, if you no, tr truly. I mean, for example, if I was to say to you, um, Nick, in order that we can look at perhaps the possibility of reducing your income tax liability, in very round figures, roughly how much is your earned income? Yeah. Pause... If we didn't answer, I mean, would it be what, 20,000 a year, 50,000 a year, 150,000 a year? I work for a very poor organisation, well, Paul, as you know. The point so, yeah. I'm making is that people would immediately, oh, 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 well, no, it's probably about the middle of that. Yeah. They were thinking previously, until I said that, that, or that, yeah. um, they were thinking, does he actually mean £21,153? It didn't get, all we wanted was an order of magnitude. Mm. And I've never had any difficulty at all in getting that sort of information. So, so is that maybe your, your skill? Because, you know, we will speak to advisors and they will say, well, I just can't, I, and all my clients don't want to do that. Is that due to, does this come back to your point about the lack of skills, yes. training or confidence in, yes. in what people A lot do? of it is confidence. Yeah. But the confidence, there's only one way of getting the confidence, and that's to practice. Yeah. Whoever became a good golfer by reading a book? Indeed. I know you've tried. <laughs> <laughs> I have read many books. But the, the okay, so, on the, so, so that's the cash flow, and that's been obviously a fundamental. Yeah. Have you, how have you, uh, if I sort of divert to the, the, the skills you talk about, have you been a fan of the, the sort of kinders and people like that? Is no. that, no, no, not at all, is it just because it's your own skills? I would say or? we pioneered as much as anybody did. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's. I'll come back to book writing later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. It's, but 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 in terms of the in terms of the business and where you've got to, you again pioneers of of, of Parapana because of the role and your son Richard doing doing that role. Uh, have you ever thought about uh, growing and scaling the business? Or, or, um, not no, because bear in mind where I came from from Tyra Law. Yeah. Um, the job there was to big, build it bigger, 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 bigger. Yes. Um, I got further and further away from seeing clients. Yeah. We had a sort of nonsense there where those who could really do the job wanted to supervise those who couldn't really do the job, so in the end nobody did the job. Yes. Not, not quite true, but there's a sort of flavour. Yeah. Um, and I love talking with my clients. Yes. So I think you can do one or the other. You can look after clients or you can build your business. Yeah. It's, quite, it's very difficult to do both. Um, the time that I've, I, I don't know, I had whatever, was a dozen, couple of dozen people that I was supervising in Tarot Law who were seeing clients, yes. and that was really hard work. Yes. You know, hour after hour after hour on a Monday. Yeah. Um, and I, I had enough of that. Yes. I wanted to help clients. And, and, and do you think then... And earn a better living, actually. Oh, sure, and you've managed to achieve that. But do, 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 you, do, you, um, see, do you think it's possible to scale... Yes, I do. ...a financial product business? If you decide what you want to do. Sure. Work on the business, yes, of yeah. course you can. But the supervision, the span of control is fairly small if you're really going to supervise how people, particularly if they're not very experienced, how they're going to look after clients, yes. that needs a scrupulously careful control or you end up with problems. Yes. Either you end up with complaints from clients or regulatory problems. The only way of having a completely clean sheet is really to supervise. Sure. And you know, the services come down, the span of control, I don't know, seven or eight or... Uh, yeah, and, 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 and within, those, within the roles, and I'll just go back to the, the power planner role with Richard doing that, how, how defined is that in your well, how important is it to get those roles? I, I think it's very right. important. Uh, the, the team, the unit yes. um, for looking after clients with financial planning, are three people, mm -hmm. the client, the financial planner, the power planner, and all three should be completely involved together as a team. Yes. Um, because we do the planning with our clients, they are absolutely, totally involved in the process. Yes. And they love it. Yes. Um, Richard does superbly what he does I couldn't have the life I have if it wasn't what he did. No. But my role, as I mentioned a moment ago, my role is to see clients and earn money, see yes. clients and earn money, see clients and earn money. <laughs> well, I can't do that and all the other stuff. Richard sees, sees our, or spends more time on our clients than I do. Yes. The, we, 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 for, for years back, 20 plus years, we got timesheets uh, saying where our time has gone. Yes. And year after year after year, client after client after client, Richard's time is more than mine. Yes. Um, and it's not surprising because an awful lot of it is, uh, they, they, the clients understand he's cheaper. Yes. Uh, that's, that actually is not being flippant. No, no. They, they, they know our hourly rates and, and his is lower. Yeah. Um, I don't mind if he gets higher. Uh -huh. <laughs> but what, and, and, and what if we extend out to the sort of broader uh, profession issues, I suppose, again, to, into, into consumer? Yeah. The, the, the understanding more about the successful financial planning businesses now is that those financial planners are looking after predominantly wealthy people. Um, you have and to you can, these you can, I know, I appreciate, but, but, but broadly, and, and not to get too down to that, but, but there seems to be a concern, or is there a concern, or is there, is there an ability to be able to deliver comprehensive financial planning to the mass affluent market or the, or the middle market? Do you As think? I say, you've got to design the terms, but ignoring yeah. that, yeah. Um, my belief is people talk about having high net worth clients. Sure. I think that's a, an irrelevancy. Yeah. What matters is you decide what service you're going to offer, you decide what price you want to charge for it, you have to be able to communicate the benefits of that service at that price. Yep. And if people are able and willing to pay that price, it doesn't matter whether they've got loads of investable capital mm -hmm. or just some money from income. I was motivated some long time back when I heard on the radio that I think it was Newcastle football, they play football up there, they, they, um, there was uh, a comment that apparently the average fan of Newcastle spends about £5,000 a year on his sport right. in terms of away matches. And Where's the problem for heaven's sake? Yes. We're talking about changing people's lives. Yes. And it was normally not going to cost them that sort of money. Well, they, they don't wear clothes. That's the that's the trade-off, I think. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so so you think it? I mean, it's clearly it's down to business model and, and, yes, and, and how you, how you to deliver it. Yes. But to, to but the, the people to get away from high net worth client. That's what yeah, the point. I agreed. I think I'd agree with that. It, to, the, to the consumer at large, what what more can we do to engage them in their need to do financial planning 
and all their needs the, the, to the, find the best way it. of all as ever yeah. is that they're introduced to it by their friends other clients yes now i know if you've got no clients at all you've got to start sure but that actually is doable as well it's only a process yeah you can delegate the whole process absolutely you can delegate it so then you start off with a small number that understand it and then they are quite excited about it yeah. and they do talk to good quality friends who are you know are, have the same sort of problems yes they really do. And do, you, and do you think there's a, in your lifetime, or even for your technology, is there ability to take technology direct to the consumer that they can start doing more financial planning themselves? I imagine they could, but why would they want to? Well, for those that, that, no, hang do, on. that, that want to say, You've money. got something wrong with you, and I can tell you where you can buy some scalpels and a, you know, a bit of stitching stuff and a bit of anaesthetic. Are you going to do the surgery yourself? Well, there are those that will, I don't know, want to try, at least try an experiment I know. It poorly. <laughs> well, well, I mean, of course, at a certain level, they can do it themselves and will have to. Yes. But really, it, it's not logical to try and do something that's skilled but yourself. To, but for those who are at a level, then clearly that's... Yeah, what they, 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 they can do it to, to a certain level. And the, the, you know, the government is in, encouraging this now at the expense of the financial services world. Sure. Uh, all of the schemes that are now just starting to emerge. Okay. They're trying to go somewhere down the road. Yeah. And because a, a proper financial planner can't accommodate more than, I don't know, 100, 120 clients, something of that order, and preferably less. I was going to say, because that, that number seems to come down now in terms of, yes. in terms of numbers I'd, of clients. I'd say that's on the high side now, yeah. because it's all taking more time. Yes. And uh, the FSA have had a clear report from, I think it was Deloitte, one of the major counseling firms, that um, post-RDR, the average advisor who's doing it properly will only accommodate about a third of the number of clients he was handling previously. Okay. So, so there's a huge gap. And a, and a great opportunity if we're, if we're starting to get that right and encourage more people to come in too. More people to come in, absolutely. The, the barriers to entry are significant and that hasn't been fully realised. Right. Uh, let me take two things if I may. Yes. The FSA quite rightly say you must run a viable business. Yes. Of course. Equally you must treat customers fairly. Tell me, please, how do I design a fee structure that will be treating my customers fairly? Well, I haven't got the faintest idea what levies you, stroke the compensation scheme, are going to ask for. So there's still some unknown factors. And that's just a shuffling of the papers. They can't answer. Of course they can't, because the whole thing's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to come and I'm going to finish on a couple of positive things. I'm going to finish on the, on the, on the, uh, on the FSA, aspects of which, of course, are positive. Um, you, you've... T 25 years in the profession, 37 years as a financial planner? Uh, 55. All right, 55, even more. Excellent. No, no, 55 in the business. Paul Etheridge in numbers. No. What's, what's Paul Etheridge's legacy? We see Jane Wheeler write a book. What, what, have you ever thought about writing a book? Or? I've already done it. You've already done it? Is it I haven't published it. I haven't published it. Because, be published? No, because I've, it, it's, it's about so thick. Um, it's been in that state for quite a while. It needs a lot of polishing, okay. but it's done. And is that, and that will, you, uh, because I'm saying having this conversation with you now, it may be done much more quickly because my wife's been nagging me to get the blessed thing finished, but it's, 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 it's there pretty much already. And, and for the future, what's, 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 what's left for you to achieve within the profession, Paul? I, I am very reluctant to retire. Yes. Um, my wife is very keen that I should retire. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a little bit of a, you know, I, 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 I love what I do, yes. I, I, mean, I genuinely do. Uh, I, I have enormous affection for our clients. But there is a, a, a binding relationship there. I don't want to let it go. Yeah. Uh, but of course, I, I, I must at some point. I'm not going to be doing this when I'm 98, am I? I no. Well, I don't think I am. Well, uh, well. But no, it, I, I don't know the answer to your question, really, because I, I, I love what I do. I, I, I think so highly of the IFP. Um, you know, all the things that so many people have contributed to build the Institute. Excellent. I mean, well, it's, it's a whole range of good people, as you know. We know we all look forward to seeing you and hearing from you for, for many years yet in terms of that story and getting more people to engage. But, but from an Institute's point of view, thank you for your contribution uh, to the first 25 years. Thank you for your time uh, today. And uh, we look forward to uh, speaking to you again in the and future. And thank you for the huge contribution you've made to it all. Thank you.